So my topic for today is breaking news, breaking news. And when we find in the text, we find Mary who was following Jesus, Mary Magdalene, not the mother of Mary. This Mary had an encounter with Jesus in which he had her exercised. He, she had seven demons that was possessing her. And after her encounter with Jesus, she became so devout after she was delivered from those seven demons that she dropped everything and began following him. She was following him, the Messiah, recognizing that there was a divine call on his life and that because he had touched her, that there was a divine call on her life. And so she dropped, out, dropped it all and began following Christ. And she knew that as the Jews and the Romans began to wage war against him, that because he was Christ, because he was the son of God, that eventually he was going to rise up and he would prove to the Romans and the Jews that they had it all mixed up. And he was the son of God and he wasn't just pretending. And so she was waiting for the moment in which Christ would be vindicated. When we find her in the text, however, he has been crucified. Imagine with me, if you will, you are riding and dying with somebody. Ride or die, okay? Mary was Jesus' ride or die. And she's riding with him all the way to the cross, anticipating at some point probably that he was going to come off of the cross. What, what do you do when you are expecting one thing to happen, but it never comes to fruition? What do you do when, as a matter of fact, it looks like the thing that you were hoping for is actually dying right in front of your face? That's where we find Mary in the text. Not only has Christ been crucified, he has been placed in a tomb, and this is three days after the crucifixion. Three days, and a lot can happen in three days. Certainly, we know the end of the story, that he is resurrected. But remove, if you will, your knowledge and imagine yourself as Mary. Not just with breaking news as in current events, but with the kind of news that breaks you. Have you ever received the kind of news that chips away at your hope? That chips away at your soul, that leaves you a little bit broken? Yeah, breaking news comes to us all. And in that breaking, we can't help but have parts of ourselves broken as well. We see it all the time in our phones when CNN an alert goes off when we recognize that what was supposed to be a normal day for someone somewhere on the other side of the world or perhaps right around our corner just became devastating. News that breaks you. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Would you go back to verse one? I want to point out something that I found pretty interesting in the text. So Mary is headed to the tomb. She's headed to the tomb because in Jewish culture, when someone passes away, you go and you take oils and spices and you anoint the body. And so she knew, though, that there would be a stone in front of the tomb because when she got there and noticed that the, st that the stone had been taken away, she was shocked. I bet you that at this point, Mary had become, she had come to a place where she was beginning to expect rejection. You see, because up until that point, she was expecting hope. She was expecting that Jesus would get off the cross. She was expecting that he would be vindicated. At this point, he's been crucified. He's buried. He's in the, tom in the tomb. And now she's wondering, what should I expect? The reality is that she was going to the tomb and hoping that the stone would have been rolled away, although she knew she couldn't roll it away herself. History tells us that the stone that was placed in front of the tomb was about 2,000 pounds. 
Have you ever found yourself walking up to an opportunity and going towards a door, if you will, but in the back of your mind, you were hoping that the door really wouldn't be open? You were knowing that you were going to go through all of the motions. You were going to go to the audition. You were going to fill out the application. You were going to go on the date. But ultimately, when it was time to be vulnerable, when it was time to train, when it was time to become better, you were hoping the door would be closed because an open door also opens you up to your own insecurities. So now the door is open to the tomb. But does she really have, have what it takes to walk inside? The stone has been rolled away. That's what she wanted. But does she really have what it takes now to go inside of the tomb? We pray that God would open doors for us, that he would roll things out of the way, that he would allow a path for us to escape. And then when it's time to take that escape, it's not always packaged the way we thought. Because for Mary, who wanted the stone to be rolled away, she didn't realize that she wouldn't be able to put oil on the body because the body wouldn't be there. What do you do when you are expecting things to go one way? And they do go that way to a certain extent. But then when it's time to take that final step to go that extra mile, there's nothing there to work with. The stone had been taken away from the tomb, so she runs to Simon and Peter, and she tells them, she runs to Simon, Peter, and John, and she tells them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter. Well, it's always a race with some people. Just, we can't both be at the red light. You got to inch up a little bit closer. Why? And came to the tomb first. You know what I bet slowed Peter down on his way to the tomb? Before Christ died, he told Peter that he was going to deny him three times. So while they both left at the same time, I bet somewhere along the line, Peter began to realize that if Jesus was there and Mary had somehow missed him, that he was going to have to answer to the fact that he had denied him three times. Isn't it crazy how sometimes our past keeps us from walking into the future because we recognize that we may have to answer some questions when we get there that we've learned to bury and hide. Okay, I'm coming. <laughs> so John gets there and he's stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, stoops down, looks into the tomb, but doesn't go in. Immediately when he recognizes that the tomb is empty, his hope, his faith then fails. You would think because he was the disciple whom Jesus loved that when he saw that the tomb was empty, that something inside of him would rise up and say, this is the moment. Maybe now he's been resurrected. This is exactly what we were waiting for. But instead he is flooded and disappointment, I want to talk about the difference between love and faith. I can love you, but I can leave you. I can love you. Love means that I accept you for who you are. Faith means, but I also think you can become better. So yes, he was the disciple whom Jesus loved, but did John have enough love to have faith in God? So much so that even faith would dictate that even when my circumstances don't look like it's working out for my good because I have faith in him, I don't believe that just because the body isn't there means he's not here anymore. Surely he's gone somewhere. 
Then Simon Peter came following him. So Simon Peter finally catches up and decides he's got his speech ready for Jesus just in case he's there. It's probably going to start like what had happened was. <clears throat> and then, and then, because I didn't know that they was talking about like you, Jesus, I thought... Because Jesus is like a common name. I didn't know it was Jesus. If it was Jesus, I was so confused. <laughs> Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. How is it? that all of the linen clothes were just jumbled up on one part of the tomb, but there was one linen cloth that was folded neatly by itself. I submit to you two questions. Why is it that it was folded by itself, and why is it that Peter was the one who saw it? I reckon that the reason why it was folded was because he wanted someone to recognize that even though it looked like he had been taken away, that he took the time to fold something before he left. That even though it looks like your life is crumbling into pieces and that it's all falling apart, that he's left something folded for you to remind you that he's yet there. Yeah, it's interesting because transition often looks like chaos. Transition often looks like confusion. It doesn't always make sense. It seems like everything is falling apart. And so you've got Mary and John who believe that the body has been taken away, that there's nowhere for their faith to go. Yet you have Peter, the one who denied Christ three times, the one who was least likely to to see Christ again, the one who thought for sure because of what I've done, because of what I've gone through, he has no use of me. Why is Peter the one who sees the folded handkerchief? Perhaps when Peter denied Christ three times, he found himself in a situation he never expected. Have you ever been surprised at something you did, but like, you did it. <laughs> Have you ever looked back on something and been like, man, I was tripping. <laughs> like, I surprised myself with that. <laughs> Peter could not believe that he was going to deny Christ three times. He couldn't believe it. But, I mean, can you argue with Jesus? Like... Jesus says you're going to deny him three times. You think it impossible, and then life happens. Life often places us in unexpected situations and turns us into people we never thought we could be. Yeah. And how we deal with those moments is our true test of character. It's not about the disciple whom Jesus loved the most. This story is about Peter the one who denied him three times, the one who probably wanted to exclude himself from destiny, being told that in spite of the fact that you denied me three times, I'm still gonna build my church on top of you. That even though your life hasn't been perfect and even though you've messed up and there's a laundry list of things that you could have done better and should have done right, instead, I still see hope inside of you. Why then is Peter the one who finds the handkerchief? I think it's because Peter had learned to not just look for the things that you expect, but to respect the things that are unexpected in life. That even loss and breaking news has a certain level of respect that gives you two paths on the road, and that is to have faith or to give up. We see Mary and we see John both stop, never even taking the time to go inside of the tomb. But Peter, who had been fueled by his own mistakes, who had been fueled by his own desperation to reconnect with Jesus, saw something that no one else could see. 
That means it's okay if you strayed away a little bit because your fuel to reconnect with Jesus is going to open your eyes that this religious relationship maybe could not have afforded you. That means that there is yet a place for you. That there is a napkin folded in the corner of your destiny and God is waiting for you to stop pretending to be busy long enough to take inventory of what you have left. So often we can be so consumed, especially in this city with looking busy. Everybody's got meetings. <laughs> this is the most meetingest city. Listen, everybody is busy, but not often do we have a lot to show for our busyness. Everybody is important, but not often do we have a lot to show for being so important. Perhaps destiny is reserved for the people who are willing to slow down long enough to look like they aren't working on anything, to look like they're being outran. I just believe right now that you, some of you have been dealing with situations where you think that someone arrived before you did, but the reality is they may have gotten there first, but they're not going to stay there very long because when you get there, you're coming with a different mindset and a different perspective that you never would have had had you not gone through your mistrials. So right now, we're going to go ahead and thank God in advance for the arrival and the process it took for us to get there. Because we recognize we weren't really being slowed down. We were being taught how to look at things so that when we got into the room, we would see folded napkins where everyone else saw linen cloths. That when we got in the room, that we would have fresh ideas and fresh creativity where everyone else just wanted to do the same old thing. I decree right now in the name of Jesus in this moment that the Holy Spirit is saturating this place right now. That chains are being broken off of you right now. That glory is filling this place. That you have not been denied. You have not been delayed. That you are right on time and right on target. And that God is going to do a new thing through you. Something he couldn't do through Mary. Something he couldn't do through John. But it took a Peter. Someone who had some missteps. Someone who had denied someone who looked like they had no purpose that God was waiting on you to come into the room that God was waiting for you to walk into the tomb that he has a napkin set aside with your name on it and if you would dare to stop outside of the tomb that you're going to miss the greatest blessing of your lifetime the difference between Mary and John and Simon Peter was one step one step that means you're one step away from your breakthrough that means you're one step away from your destiny that means you're one step from everything turning around that means you're one step from being on the edge of amazing and stepping into glory that you're one step away from who you always knew you could be but doubt convinced you otherwise if you believe that, I just want you to take one step. Just take one step. Just let the enemy know right now that you're taking one step, that you're walking away from who you used to be and walking towards what God has called you, that you recognize that there is destiny down inside of you still. And all it takes is one step. Peter has... The dirtiest past of everyone we see in the text. He has the least likely outcome of everyone we see in the text. How is it the one who denied Christ three times was the one who saw him first? How is it the one who didn't look like they had it all together was the one who got the job? How is it the one who didn't look like they had the income or had the job still has their car, still has their rent? How is it the one who doesn't have any ends to meet but some kind of way God keeps on providing and he keeps on leaving crumbs after crumbs after crumbs you give me reasons. You give me reasons. Can we have a moment to worship him for reasons right now? You give me reason after reason after reason after reason. Napkin after napkin after napkin is 
folded for me. That where everyone else saw linen cloths, that some kind of way I saw a napkin. That when the stone was rolled away and some people turned because they were afraid that they wouldn't have what it takes to walk into the room, that you ordered my steps. That I was in perfect alignment. That I was in the right place at the right time for breakthrough to happen for me. I want to know who's willing to walk into the tomb. I want to know who's willing to look for the napkin. I want to know who's willing to not let their circumstances dictate their tomorrow. Because if we allow our circumstances to dictate our tomorrow, we'll find ourselves like John coming to church every Sunday in love with Jesus, knowing he loves us, but too afraid to act on that love. He never meant to harm you or discourage you or disappoint you. And in fact, what he meant was quite the opposite. He needed to prune you. Y'all sit down, I'm just talking. (laughs) And you get me all fired up. (sighs) If you could put the text back up for me. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also. He was a leader. Peter was a leader, the one who was least likely convinced, the one who seemed to have it all together to go into the tomb. Not When you walk into the tomb, you're not just bringing yourself. Your mother's coming with you. Your father's coming. Your friends are coming. Your relationship is coming. And anybody who can't come into the tomb needs to stay outside of it anyway because we're tomb walkers in here. And he saw and believed. Some kind of way, in that moment, what should have been a tomb becomes a womb. That what should have been a dead thing, a place for holding dead things, now becomes a place of faith being developed. Because we see that John went from not believing and outside of the tomb to inside of the tomb and witnessing the napkin, and now he believes. Maybe I I just want to interrupt your regularly scheduled program to tell you that the thing you've been calling a tomb is actually a womb. That the areas in your life that you thought were dead, that you were just about to give up on, that the areas in your life that you had counted out and that other people said were never going to make it was a place of development. And when you recognize that your tomb is actually a womb, you'll stop mourning what you think you lost and recognize that there are destiny moments left for you. That your very breath is a promise that God still has something for you. And because he still has something for you, it doesn't matter what happened to you. Doesn't matter what they said. Doesn't matter what they believed. It doesn't matter the lies you told yourself. All that matters is whether or not you're willing to open up the stone, open up the tomb, and begin to search yourself for pieces that God has left behind. I have to tell you that uh, one of the most difficult times in my marriage with your pastor was when I told him that I felt, okay, I have to tell you the whole story, and I'm going to be fast, and then we're going to have altar call, and then we're going to let you go because we're over time. But here's the thing. So some of you all know, you know, I, had, I was a teen mom. I had my son at 13 years old, and now I have a daughter with PT, and it feels like everything is full circle. And so we're walking into this restaurant, and as we're walking into the restaurant, I see our oldest daughter holding our baby girl, Ella, and just in a moment, I have this flashback of being 14 years old, holding my son out with my family, and I think to myself, man, it must have been really hard to be a teen mom. But sometimes we can become so consumed with trying to make it look like we have it all together that we rob ourselves of the opportunity to truly heal. And so I was sharing this with PT, and I thought, you know, I was just going to tell him this. And he told me, you know, well, that means that there's still something there that needs to be healed. And I was like, you don't have to, like, pastor me, okay? I'll pray about it. Listen, being married to a man of God is really something else, okay? (laughs) 
And so he tells me, how did you feel when you were that 14-year-old girl? And I began to express to him some of the feelings that I had. And then just in that moment, the Holy Spirit just really comes into the room. And he's able to, it's interesting because God is not limited to time. He takes me back to being this 14-year-old girl. And in that moment, his spirit is healing all of this brokenness and damage that I thought was healed. Why do I say that? Because in that moment when we were reflecting on that time in my life, I recognized that there was a folded napkin there that I missed. That I was so afraid of having to confront my truth that I robbed myself of the opportunity to see that God was still in the places that I had buried. That God still had hope and he still had promise and the ability to heal that which I had learned to conceal. And as I prepare to close, I want to have an altar call. And if you don't mind, before you stand up, this is what's going to happen. People are going to grab their purses and go dashing out of the door. And let me tell you why I pray you will reconsider that. Because we're going to have an altar call and someone's going to make the decision to step into their tomb so that God can make it a womb. And I'm not sure what special is at Starbucks or what time your brunch reservation is, but if you could not rob them of this opportunity to have an encounter with God that can develop something in them that changes the very trajectory of their lives, I would be most appreciative. Would you please stand with me as I prepare to close? As I was discussing the text, I had to ask myself, What is the main idea? What is the main subject of the text? What is God trying to tell us? And it dawns on me that Peter is the star of the text, that it wasn't really the folded napkin like I thought, and it wasn't the disciple whom Jesus loved like I thought. It wasn't even Mary Magdalene like I thought. It was Peter, the one who had denied Christ three times, yet the church would be built on him. It was the one who had to become so desperate and so broken for a touch from God that it changed the way he saw life, that it changed the way he saw the tomb. And I just believe that there are people in this room have been, who have been looking at certain areas of their life, whether it's their past or their present. They've watched situations fall apart. They've watched relationships go away they've been dealing with bitterness and unforgiveness and they've just learned to conceal it and continue to live like it's not there and I just happen to believe that there's someone here who's ready to take that tomb and turn it into a womb that you're not exactly sure how things are going to work together for your good but you know that you love God and you know that there's a plan for your life and and you just want to believe that he can do something with what you have left would you consider meeting us at the altar would you consider stepping taking that one extra step coming that extra mile so that God can have his way in your life in a brand new way Peter proves to us that this is not about perfection. This is not about having it all together. This is about admitting that there's something inside of me that's a little bit dead and a little bit broken and my hope has nowhere to go and I'm not exactly sure and I don't have all the answers but I just happen to believe that there's still hope for me. And if God could do it for Peter, and maybe if God could do it for FL, if God could do it for PT, that maybe he would consider allowing me to open my heart and to face the fact that something in me died years ago. But as you were speaking and as you were expressing the word that I I felt a heartbeat again, That where there was a tomb in my life, the things that I thought I was fine living with, the things that I was masquerading as okay, that as you were speaking, I felt something inside of me kick. I think that there's still life inside of me, and I want it to be developed so that I can have access to all of who God is. Here's the reality that Mary and John could have continued to have a relationship with Christ, even had they never discovered the folded napkin. But because Peter saw the folded napkin and invited them to see the folded napkin, they had access to another dimension of Christ that they would have never seen. 
What I'm telling you is they were looking for Christ's body, but what they found and said was his spirit. And the same spirit that was in that tomb is available to you right now in this moment. And we don't invite you down to the altar to masquerade you or to embarrass you. No, in fact, it's quite the opposite. It is to serve negativity and notice that it no longer has its hold on you. That when you walk out of your space of comfort, that chains are being broken and strongholds are coming down because you recognize that there's still something left inside of you. And no amount of shade can keep your light from shining. No amount of shade could keep you from walking into who God has called you to be unless you allow it. I want to know if there's anyone else who wants to join this body of believers. Come out of your seat and join us at the altar. Step out of your comfort zone so that God can show you your tombs and he can turn them into wombs. And you don't have to pretend anymore. You don't have to hurt any longer. That you can look back at yourself at 14 years old with a baby and still recognize that God loved that broken little girl too. That God loved Peter when he was denying him and he loved you when you were in the middle of your mess. You're never too far from the reach of God. You're never out of his touch, ever. But oftentimes we rob ourselves of an opportunity to be held by God because we've come to a place where all we expect is rejection. And right now, I just decree in the name of Jesus that we're going to shift our expectations not to fit our circumstances, but to fit the word from God that we received. That even when we receive knows that our expectations aren't going to adjust in our relationships, that we're not going to settle for what we think we deserve. Because if God gave us what we deserve, none of us would have a chance. But because he is so faithful and because he's committed to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we may ask or think, we're going to allow God the opportunity to blow our minds. Don't just give us what we ask for, God. Give us what you desire for us. Don't just give us what we want, oh God. Give us what we need. And no matter how that comes about, it is well in our soul. Pastor, would you pray for us? There's such a there's such a there's such a glory on First Lady. I, want, I actually want you to pray. I want to lay hands while you pray. So just seal this word with, with prayer. Before we pray, just one more opportunity to join us. The word says that where two or three are gathered in His name, there He shall be in the midst. And because we are expecting and believing that He will be in the midst of this body of believers. I just see a wave of tombs transforming into wombs as we seal this in prayer. And if you want to be a part of that transformation, I encourage you to come join us. Father God, search us as only you can do. Open our hearts to your truth and take us back to those moments where we were scared little girls and scared little boys searching for hugs and embraces. And help us to recognize that there was a folded napkin there. Help us to look at the areas in our lives right now where we are threatened to feel discouraged or disappointed. Maybe things aren't going the way we expected, but help us to realize they're going exactly how you planned. That you're working all things together for our good. So, Father, I thank you for every tomb represented at this altar. Because we know that because there is a tomb, that there's also resurrecting power. And we just decree resurrecting power right now in the name of Jesus, that they're going to live again, oh God. That a well is going to spring up inside of them. And as that well springs up, that they're going to have new ideas and new creativity and new hope and new desires. Forgiveness right now in the name of Jesus. Some of us are struggling to forgive and struggling to move on, not recognizing that our unwillingness to forgive is keeping us at bay that our destiny cannot be fulfilled until we let go of our past we think that by us being bitter that we're punishing the other person but in fact destiny is being withheld because only those who have a clean hands and clean heart can approach you oh god so cleanse our hearts oh god until all we see is you and cleanse our spirits oh god until all that is left is you if the relationship isn't you break it if the job isn't you 
take it. If the opportunity isn't from you, remove it right now in the name of Jesus. All we have room for is you, oh God. We want to know you in a new way, oh God. Show us our identity, oh God. Show us that we haven't been rejected or abandoned, but we've been preserved, oh God. That when we thought we were isolated, that it was actually protection, oh God. And so we thank you for protection, oh God. That we were resenting the very thing that kept us from becoming like all the others we saw fall off, oh God. But instead, that you've chosen us to walk this sometimes lonely road because we have the strength to take it. So show us our own endurance, oh God. Show us our own perseverance. Show us your strength being made perfect in our weakness. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would identify every folded napkin in our life, oh God. Every promise that is yes and amen. Every promise that we thought we lost, oh God, that it would just come flooding in our lives. I decree harvest right now in the name of Jesus. That there is a harvest that awaits us, oh God. And that we won't reject we won't walk away from it but we'll do whatever it takes to reap the harvest you have for us and because we recognize that harvest takes work make us vulnerable oh God so vulnerable that all we have is you so vulnerable that all we have is your promise oh God and that we're okay with that give us peace oh God peace for our destiny peace for our lives peace to walk into tombs and not be afraid of what we see and as we begin to see things in a new way, in a new light, help us to believe again. Not just for what we expect, but to believe in the unexpected. To recognize that every day is a destiny moment. And that unexpected things can happen to extraordinary people that changes our lives. I look forward to the miracles represented at this altar, oh God. That you're going to make a way out of no way, oh God. That bills are going to be paid. That doors are going to be open, oh God. That opportunities to grow are going to happen. That mentorship is going to take place. That we're going to see ourselves, not who we are now, but who you called us to be five years from now. That we're going to be laughing that we even thought this was an issue because we recognize that it was a setup, oh God. And so we thank you for breakthrough, not a breakdown. We rebuke the spirit of breakdown right now in the name of Jesus. Enemy, you have no place here. The earth may be shaking around us and things may be falling apart, but our hope is on the rock of our salvation, oh God. That when all things have passed away and all things are going astray, that we recognize that you hold the world in your hand. So show us, Father, oh God. Show us your world. Show us your word and let that word take Take root in our lives and produce fruit that says, I've been with them all along. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, we have prayer to the left. Pastor, do you want to say anything before we? Wow. Let's just celebrate God for this moment. Happy Mother's Day. You've mothered us. You've mothered not just those who are here, but, but thousands. Thank you so much. We honor you and bless and pour. She's got one more to do today. So we just bless and pour more into you. May the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious towards you. May he lift up his countenance over you and grant you shalom, shalom in Jesus' name.